Hey guys, it's Victoria and today I am going to talk to you about sleep. So sleep is one of the hot topics that all new parents deal with and I think it's one of the things that new parents um, and all parents stress out about and worry about and think about more than any other thing when their babies are born. I mean when a baby's born they basically eat, sleep, poop and cry. And I think if you can get the sleep down, then you can handle just about anything else. And if you have a baby that does not like to sleep, it makes everything exponentially more difficult. Um, we have three children and I, I feel like at this point with number three, we have sort of figured out what works for us when it comes to getting our children to sleep well. Um, I believe for my family that Sleep is a skill that we have a responsibility to teach our children, just like any other skill. Um, there are, of course, some children where it will come naturally, and there are other children that just need a little bit of help. And I have children that fall into both of those categories. Um, a little bit of a sort of disclaimer, of course, everything that I'm going to share, all of my tips are things that work for my family. They might not work for you, you might not agree with them, that's totally fine. If you're somebody who likes to keep the baby in a bassinet, you like to co-sleep, you like to let the baby sleep in the swing, you like, whatever you choose to do, if it works for you, that's awesome. So the things I'm going to share are just my experiences and what works for my family. The second thing that I know is a little bit controversial, I guess, is that I do believe in the cry it out method. I hate, hate, hate the term cry it out. I wish that there was another term to describe the, the certain methods that sort of fall into that category, but that seems to be the sort of what people call it. Um, I hate it because I feel like it implies that people who use that method or any of the cry it out methods that they just leave their children to cry for hours without comforting them, you know, inconsolable, and that's just not, that's not the case. Um, I have never read about one sleep method, an actual, you know, an actual research method that would ever encourage that, um, not even a little bit. So that's why I don't like that term because my children have never been left to cry without any type of comfort ever. Um, I prefer to call it like an interval method. The method that we used was the Ferber method, which is just your basic, you know, you go in at set intervals, making the intervals a little bit longer each time. And it has worked really, really well for us. So I do believe in that method for my family. And it all, again, comes back to the fact that I believe it is my job to teach my children to sleep properly. And I think that is a life skill that can impact them for the rest of their lives. If they learn that they are okay on their own, they are able to fall asleep on their own, they are safe, they are loved, their mommy and daddy are not far away, they're there for them if they need them, but they are able to do this on their own. And I think that is a really important skill to teach your children. So, okay, I guess that's sort of my disclaimer. <laughs> Um, I'll just give a brief recap um, of how things have gone sleep-wise for our three children. So we have a five-year-old, a uh, two-and-a-half, almost three-year-old, she'll be three in August, and a almost four-month-old. And each child has progressively been a better sleeper. And of course, there's probably a million different reasons for that. You know, Noah was our first. We didn't really know what we were doing. Um, it took a while to figure out sort of our rhythm and our groove. Or Alexandria, we had a little bit more of experience. And Lydia, I think we, we really knew how we wanted to approach sleep before she was born. And we were lucky that our approach worked for her. Now, if another baby, if we had another baby, then who knows? Maybe the way that we've chosen to handle sleep with Lydia would completely backfire and wouldn't work at all. So you just never know. I think we've been very lucky to have children that are good sleepers. I think a lot of that is just the way they are, they're, they're born that way. But I think um, our approach and the way we handle it does play does play a big part. At least I'm gonna tell myself that and take, take some credit for it. So Noah, he is five, he was five in March, and he has been our more challenging sleeper since, uh, since he was really little. Um, he was very typical for the first probably nine months or so. You know, he started sleeping six hour stretches at a couple of months and then gradually increased. 
increase that. Um, he was in a bassinet in our room for only three weeks and then we moved him to his crib and he slept there. He did take a soother and so even when he started sleeping through the night, I still was up usually at least once or twice a night to just replace his soother. So that was something that, um, that we had to do in the night. Um, now, it, as he approached a year, probably between nine months and a year, he started that he didn't want to be put down. I would rock him and rock him and rock him till he was sound asleep, lay him down and then do the tiptoe, get back to my room and he'd start crying. And this went on for a while. And that's when we said, okay, this is not working. This is not working for us. It's not working for him. We need to do something. So I had heard about the Ferber method. My parents talked about it. You know, it's one of the, the oldest sleep training methods out there, I think. Um, and we thought it was something that sounded that it, like it would work for us. So we tried that and within a few days, we no longer had that issue. And we have had to come back to using the Ferber method many times with Noah. Um, Another phase he went through was where he would wake up in the night and not want to go back to sleep. So we ended up bringing him in with us and he would sleep with us for the rest of the night just because we didn't want to deal with trying to get him back to sleep. But after a little while, that wasn't working for us. So we started to use the same method in the middle of the night to get him back to sleep. Um, when we took away his soother and when we switched him into a big boy bed, it wasn't so much that he would cry as he would get out of bed and come out into the hallway or come to our room and we would have to take them back and it's a similar method where you know you don't talk to them don't make eye contact take them back to their bed put them in cover up and walk it and I had to do that when we got rid of his soother the first couple of nights it was hours it was really hard because he really didn't know how to go to sleep without a soother um, so we used the same type of method again at that time our biggest issue with Noah now is that he is a night owl and he gets that on us because my husband and I are big night owls too. We always stay up way later than we should and then complain how tired we are in the morning and we have no one to blame but ourselves. Um, but he will go to bed usually pretty good, get into bed, but then he plays and he reads and he he plays with his toys and of course we can take the toys out if it's, if it's an issue. It's really not at this point because he's not in school. And we usually don't have anywhere to be in the morning. So if he stays up a little bit late at night, he can sleep in a little bit in the morning, although that doesn't always happen. Um, so I know once the fall hits and he starts school, we'll have to crack down on that and probably have like a... I, I understand when you get in bed, it's hard to go right to sleep. I'm the same, so I get that. So we'll probably try and let him go to bed. You have 10 minutes to play, we'll set an alarm or something, and then it's sleep time, and we're gonna have to be strict on that because he has to, he'll have to get the bus at 7.30, which is early. Like right now, it's quarter to 10, and Noah's still in his pajamas because we're just, you know, we're just hanging around. We're not in any rush to get anywhere. Um, so that's gonna be a big change for him. Now, Alexandria, she was very different when it comes to sleep. She was really, really difficult the first few months. Now, she was a preemie, so there's that. She would not take a soother. We tried every soother under the sun, not a chance. And she loved to cluster feed. She would nurse for hours, like two, three hours at night. I would just go back and forth, side to side, and it just took her a really long time to settle. Now, once she finally would go to sleep, she would sleep pretty well. And she started sleeping good, long, you know, six, nine hour stretches, probably in the first couple of months. And that just grew from there. And I remember it was a bit of a, we were in a bit of turmoil, turmoil at that time of our lives because we were moving, we were building a house. It's a long story. We ended up living at Matthew's parents' house. And so I remember when we had, when we moved in with his, his mom, it was only for a few weeks. And I remember at that point, I could nurse her once, lay her down, she would cry. I would call it her false start, get her back up, nurse her again and put her down. And she would sleep through till the morning. And when we moved into our new house, so she was about four months old then, at that point something clicked and she would nurse and go to bed. And ever since, she has been a dream. She does suck her thumb, so that helps because she always has it with her. It's not, I don't have to go in and find it and replace it like a soother. So that is nice. Um, but she, to this day, we put her in bed. It's very quick, you know, we read a story, say a quick prayer, a little song, talk, talk, and that's good. But I'll hear her in there. I guess she's like Noah in this sense for, oh, 
half an hour or more sometimes just talking, looking at books, just, you know, just happy. And then she'll eventually put it away and fall asleep. And she's done that for a long time. Um, she still naps with most days, which is awesome. Usually from about 1 30 or two till about three 30. Um, some days she doesn't. And if she misses a nap, it's not a big deal. If we have something to do, I don't worry about it. Um, but a lot of days she will still nap. So that is, is really nice. Noah stopped napping at about two and a half. So right when Alexandria was born, Noah stopped napping. Um, so we do still, she does still go down for a nap most days. So now baby number three. Lydia, we had a very defined approach to how we wanted to tackle sleep. Um, there's a lot of, I feel that a, that a lot of parents end up creating a lot of extra steps in their sleep journey that you probably don't need to create if you want to create. If you want to do it that way, that's totally fine. But for me, I figured the, close, the closer we can get to the long-term sleeping patterns that we want from day one, the better. Like, we might as well set ourselves up for, for success. And if the ultimate goal is sleeping 12 hours at night in her crib, putting her down awake and she falls asleep on her own, if that's the ultimate goal, why not try to get as close to that as possible from the beginning and then work towards that? So that's sort of what we did. Um, now, Alexandria, I didn't mention this. She was in a bassinet in our room for about six weeks only because we weren't living at home and, and we weren't living in our own house and we didn't want to put the, back, the crib together. Um, but about six weeks she went into her crib. So I'm going to, I have a list here of six things that we have used with Lydia to, sorry that was a really long like backstory, but I wanted to explain sort of how we got to this point and how we figured out really what works for us. Um, so I have a list of six things that we have implemented with Lydia that I believe have helped to make her an amazing sleeper and again I'll say that a lot of it is probably her temperament and her demeanor you know, she's the third baby and I think third babies probably just know that um, they have to be a little bit more easygoing than a first baby because their parents attention is split three ways so they're not always able to get their needs met the second that they cry or that they start to fuss so I think a lot of that probably has affected her being a really good sleeper so the first thing we did with Lydia is she was in her crib from day one. From the day we came home from the hospital, she slept in her crib. Um, of course, babies sleep all the time around the clock. So I approached it as that the first time she would fall asleep after 7 p.m., she would go in her crib and she would stay in her crib for sleep until 7 a.m. the next morning. Um, any feedings that happen, this is probably getting on to another another one of my points every feeding that happened throughout that seven to seven time frame was in her room in the rocker dark room quiet so I would get her up nurse her and then put her back and of course not every time did she fall back asleep sometimes I would have to get her up again and rock her and we don't do any type of cry it out we haven't even at this point she's almost four months so this way we were sort of indicating her to her that this is nighttime this is when you go in your crib now, other naps throughout the day, and again, of course, babies nap all different times throughout the day. Every day is different. Some of them would be in her swing. Some would be in the bassinet downstairs. But I would try to have at least two naps, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, in her crib. Just try to do that so that she gets used to that. So, I mean, of course, a lot of people like the bassinet. They like having the baby close to them. But for me, I found with Noah, at least, um, with both of the babies, that they're noisy, they're, they're grunty, they shuffle, they make a lot of noise, and having them right next to me just did not, it didn't help me sleep and it didn't help them sleep. So that's one reason. And of course I like that they, they sort of know that this is their nighttime sleeping spot. And um, I found with Noah, I would get him up and I would turn the TV on and I found that that would sort of wake him up too much. So this way all feedings are quiet in, the, in her crib in her room. Um, number two is a routine. And of course, you're not going to have much of a routine with a newborn, but I wanted to set up, this is your bedtime routine from day one. So with Noah, again, I keep going back to him because I guess he was our, our challenging sleeper and where we didn't know anything about what we were doing. Um, I would always try to keep him up as late as possible like before putting him into his bed because I figured if I don't put him down until we go to sleep, then we get a longer stretch. Um, and that just never really seemed to work. So with Lydia, again, the first time after 7 p.m. that she got fussy, and now it's really anytime after 6.30 that she gets fussy, 
We take her upstairs, we bath her, put her in her pajamas, she usually plays a little bit, and then we give her her bottle in her room. So she has a bath every single night. She has probably missed maybe three nights since she was born. Um, a lot of people don't like to bath their babies that much because it's it can be drying on their skin. Um, we've been lucky that her skin has been fine. We, do, we just put some lotion on after and she's good. Um, we don't use soap every time. Maybe a couple times a week do we sort of wash her hair, even though she's pretty much bald, and wash her body down. Other than that, it's just water. And I just, I think it's good because it tires them out. You kind of get an extra 20 minutes, half an hour, when all is said and done from the beginning to the end. Um, of awake time, which is good before bed, and I think it's sort of a, a something in their brain that sig signals this is, again, the start of my bedtime. So we did that from day one. Um, the next point is all the bottles, or breastfeeding, in her room. Again, I said this, between seven and seven. So we don't, she doesn't leave her room. Um, at all we don't bring her into bed with us and again I know I don't need to keep saying this but if you choose to do that and that works for you that's awesome but we keep it all in her room um, this is one that I definitely had to learn from child to child and I've gotten better at is not responding to every noise because babies are noisy they make a lot of noise when they're newborns you know they sometimes have a lot of like they can have congestion from you know just fluid in in their lungs and stuff that they're trying to to move around um, get comfortable they, they shuffle a lot they grunt a lot and if you jump up and respond to every little noise you'll be up all night so, and I think this is something too that you just get better at and more confident with as you have more children because you know the noises, you know when they need you and when they're just making noise. So, um, I don't respond in the night until it becomes clear that they, they need me for something. Um, so if it's just a little, a little squawk, a little, a couple little cries, I'll wait, um, you know, a couple minutes to make sure that make sure that she really needs it before I go in. Um, and most of the times, even early, she would settle back down. And now at four months, she, she does, she sleeps through the night now. Um, she does make noises throughout the night and I'll hear her. And sometimes I'll go in and just look and make sure that she's okay. And I actually have to move her down in her crib a lot because she scooches her way like into the top corner. So I have to pull her down a lot and cover her back up. Um, Number five, and this is one that is definitely not for everybody and I know is pretty controversial, is our baby's tummy sleep. With Noah, it was probably a couple months. Alexandria, it was about six weeks and that was the time that we switched her out of her, out of her bassinet into her crib. And with Lydia, it was within the first couple of weeks, I would put her on her back for the first stretch of the night and then after her, she would feed, I would put her back on her belly. And I'm comfortable with it. I know not everybody is. Um, I feel that we do it in a very safe way. In my opinion, having her in her crib, no bumper pads, no stuffed animals, just a light afghan that is full of holes that if it got over her, it would not stop her from breathing at all. Um, in my opinion, that is safer than parents who are struggling so much to get their babies to sleep on their backs and they won't so they end up bringing them into bed with them on their chest in the bed in my opinion I know I keep saying that what we do is safer than that um, of course there are very safe ways to co-sleep but I think a lot of parents end up doing it without planning and without researching it because they're so exhausted they just they'll do anything and I, for me, having her sleep in her crib is safer than my resorting to that because I'm out of desperation, I guess. Um, so yeah, she sleeps on her belly and she just looks so much more comfortable. I just, I don't know, I just feel like poor babies sleeping flat on their back just looks so uncomfortable, but I know it works for, for most babies, but there definitely are a lot more tummy sleepers out there than, than you think because when you start talking about it, you hear from so many people, oh yeah, we did too. And, I think it's people don't like to talk about it because it is you know it's not recommended and it is controversial but 
Um, it's babies have slept on their bellies for years, and at this point, I mean, she's four months old. She can move around tons. I mean, she crawl. She doesn't crawl, but she scooches all over her bed, and she turns her head and everything. So I'm not worried. And even when we first started at a few weeks old, she could turn her head from side to side, and she didn't move around at all. So I felt I felt comfortable with it, and I think it really, really does help um, them become better sleepers. Um, and the last one. I think that your approach and your feelings about sleep really impact the way the child will sleep. Um, and what I mean by that is that we always try to be confident and upbeat when it's bedtime. Um, I think so many people get so anxious and so nervous. Oh my God, it's bedtime. They're not going to sleep. I'm going to be up all night. Um, you know they've been really fussy lately and we're not we're gonna have a terrible night and I think when you approach the night like that the baby feeds off of that and I know it's really hard to fake it if you're not feeling confident and upbeat and positive it's hard to pretend but I just encourage people to try to think this is going to be a good night no matter if every night before has been terrible this is going to be a good night. We're going to put you in your bed. You're going to go to sleep. I even will try talking to her. Like if we if we would have about a few a few bad nights, I would say, "Okay, tonight we're going to have a good night. We're going to go to bed. We're going to sleep really good." And I know it might sound crazy, and I'm not somebody who normally like buys into a lot of that type of stuff, but I really really think that that works. That your attitude plays a big part in how your child will sleep because they feed off of that. They feed off of your anxiety. I always say to people, don't let them know your, don't let them smell your fear. You know, they know when you're nervous and when you're anxious and you're scared and they feed off of that and it helps, it doesn't help them feel settled. So I think the more you can project that feeling of confidence and um, optimism, the more they feed off of that. So that is what we have done with Lydia and she started sleeping through the night at about six weeks and now she she does go down to bed usually pretty awake and falls asleep and will sleep through and it's amazing you know I had these I had so many fears I would lay there in bed with the two the two older kids sleeping when I was pregnant and think I'm never gonna sleep again three kids I'm never gonna sleep and I think all of these things that we have implemented really helped get us to this point where we're all getting good night's sleep and like I said at the beginning if you can get a good night's sleep if you have a baby that sleeps you can deal with just about anything else and I really I really believe that so um, hopefully this video gave you guys some, some tips of things that might work for you with your babies and if none of them work for you or there none of them are things that you're interested in trying that's that's great too I think we all do whatever we can to get our babies to sleep and whatever we choose to do is the right thing for them. So thanks for watching. Sorry this was a little bit long. Um, I had a lot to say on this topic and I've been trying to make this video for like weeks and I've sat down a couple times and then the kids come in. They're upstairs right now and I'm supposed to be making them breakfast but I thought I would come on here and do a quick video and then make breakfast. So anyway, thanks so much for watching and I will talk to you in my next video. Have a great day.